Gospel of Luke. We are in chapter 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then down to verse 11. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the young son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to, to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older brother was in the field. When he came near the house, and he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. That's the word of the Lord this morning. You might recognize this if you've got kids. I'm not preaching from this today. You'll be glad to know. It's the Jesus Storybook Bible. Um, this is a great resource. We've read it a few times through with our kids. Uh, it's really good for seeing how the Bible fits together as one big story. It tells that really well. It does a good job of that. The second thing it does really well is it shows you how all the little stories in it ultimately point us forward or backward to Jesus does a great job of that. And it's not good just for kids. Like if you are a new Christian or you don't know the Bible pretty well, this is actually a pretty good resource. It's an easy read. It's quite accessible without being simplistic. And it gives you a pretty good handle on the scriptures. My kids, uh, they love one story and they request it all the time. They're always like, Dad, can we please read the poo story? Um, you might find your kids like it too. It's the one where Jesus washes his disciples' feet. So, yeah. Now, it has uh, a lot of stories in it, but it, uh, and it doesn't have every story in the Bible, but it does have the one we're looking at this morning. And the trouble with the way it tells that story is it only tells half of it. It only tells the story of the younger brother and completely leaves out the story of the older brother. And the story of the younger brother in here is, is told in such a way that it's this big triumphant ending. Uh, it ends on this real high note. The, uh, the younger brother comes home, he's hit rock bottom, and uh, he expects to be at best taken back as a servant, but instead dad takes him back as a son, welcomes him home, and throws a party for him. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a great high note, you know, and it ends with singing and dancing, and everyone's happy. I mean, it's like, it's like those movies that end in a wedding, and, and the credits roll on, or everyone's happy and smiling and dancing, or the Avengers have defeated Thanos. It's a great ending. It's good triumphing over evil. It's 
it's a great story and it's told really well. The only problem I have with telling the story that way is that Jesus didn't tell it that way. Jesus didn't end on a high note, did he? He ended on an ambiguous note. So you've got the older brother outside throwing a tantrum, refusing to join the party. And we don't know if he ever did. And it's this real ambiguous ending. So I wonder whether the author of this Bible didn't quite know what to do with the older brother, didn't quite fit the narrative. And, and I wonder maybe when we read Luke 15, I, I think maybe we don't quite know what to do with him either. And perhaps we just ignore him or leave him out altogether as well. So good news, I'm going to help you this morning. Um, I want you to put yourself in the older brother's shoes. I want you to feel what he felt. Okay. And to do that, I want you to think about a situation where you really wanted something, but you didn't get it. And you had to watch somebody else get the thing you wanted. Maybe you really wanted to be on a sports team. You didn't make the cut, but your less skilled and less talented friends got onto the team. Maybe there was a particular job going at work that you thought, I'm perfect for this role. And in the end, they gave the job to someone with a lower qualification than you and a lot less experience. Maybe you really wanted to get a, a really good grade for a paper or a class you were taking. And you did all your assignments and handed them in on time. You went to class every day and you scraped through with a C-. minus. And your friends who almost never turned up to lectures and asked you to borrow a pen when they sat down to a test, they cruised through with an A+. Maybe you've really wanted to get married, to start a family, to buy a house, settle down. And you've been to all your friends' weddings, but you are still single. Hmm. How do we feel? Feeling good on Sunday morning? Glad you came? Wonderful situations we're talking about this morning. We've all had something like that. Thousands of situations in between. How do we feel? You know, we might be nice to our friends when good things happen to them, but inside we're saying, is the coach blind? How could he put them on the team? I'm twice the player they are. Oh, it's not fair. How could they give the job to them? Don't they know how many hours I've put behind this desk? How many years I've slaved away in this business? Oh, I've got such high qualifications. I've got so much experience. It's not fair. Oh, how is it that I have to work so hard to get a passing grade in this paper? And my friends, they just cruise through with an A. They just cruise through life and good things just fall into their lap. It's not fair. Why am I stuck here? Why is my life not moving forward? Why is this happening to me? How come all my friends are getting married and moving on with life? Why am I stuck here? It's just not fair. Behind all the hurt and disappointment, I think there's that same reaction every time, isn't there? It's not fair. Now, I don't know about you, but if I feel like I'm owed something, if I feel like I, I'm I deserve something, but it's being withheld from me. I get pretty angry. And then to watch someone else get the very thing I want, you know, the thing that I'm missing out on, it starts to make me quite bitter and resentful. Does it do that to you? Oh, just me? Okay. Phew. Oh, okay. <laughs> Preach it to myself today. <laughs> uh, when we feel like that, we are in the shoes of the older brother. That's exactly how he felt. Angry, bitter, resentful. It's not fair. Have a look at verse 29 and 30. All these years I've been slaving for you. I never disobeyed your orders once. But you couldn't even give me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. And when he says slaving, he's not exaggerating there. This was a family that had hired servants and possibly slaves. And he's saying to his dad, I've worked for you as if I was like one of your hired hands. My whole life was about following every one of your commands. I didn't consider that I had any freedom of my own. I just did absolutely everything you could possibly have asked me to do. But you couldn't even give me a small token of appreciation, this little animal, a small goat. And instead, 
You kill the fattened calf for that lazy, wasteful, family-shaming, squandering son of yours. Notice how it's not my brother, but it's your son. I've got a brother, and I don't think I've ever been able to say that he's just your son, not my brother. So it's pretty angry. And I have to watch this, this younger brother, this son of yours, be celebrated like a hero instead of me. It's not fair. I don't deserve this. There's a reason we read uh, verse 1 this morning of this, uh, this passage, because it sets the context. Jesus had a crowd full of older and younger brothers in front of him. On the one hand, he's got the tax collectors and the sinners, and just read, you know, prostitutes, gamblers, alcoholics, adulterers, collaborators with Rome. These are the younger brothers, the ones who've lived clear, sinful lives. They've run from God in the complete opposite direction, and they know it. But then you've got the older brothers. These are the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. These are the good people, the upright, the moral people, the hardworking ones. Right? Now, if Jesus had stopped his story with the story of the younger brother, all of these older brothers in the crowd would have gone, oh, great. I guess I'm fine. I'm pretty good. Those guys over there, they're the sinful ones. I'm not the sinful one. I don't need any of this grace business. I'm pretty good. But what Jesus wants both groups to see is that they are equally sinful and that they both stand before God equally in need of his grace in order to be saved and that both groups ultimately uh, have only one way to be righteous, that there is only one way to be part of God's family and that is by grace alone. The younger brother's story, it's really about how God saves the unrighteous one, right? Someone who knows that they've got no righteousness of their own. The older brother's story ultimately then is about how God saves the self-righteous. So what we're going to do the rest of the time this morning is just dig into the passage and see what it has to tell us about self-righteousness and how that might affect us. Have you ever been for a job interview before? Have you? Yeah, I guess so we have, yeah, a few of you. If you haven't, they're going to ask you a pretty common question. I think you'll get it at everyone. How would your colleagues describe you? Mm. Self-righteous. <clears throat> Probably not top of the list, is it? I'd be horribly offended if any of my friends said that about me. It's not a word we use to describe ourselves. Nobody ever says, I'm self-righteous. It's so great to be self-righteous, isn't it? It's awesome. Life's just the best. The only time we would ever use the phrase, it's probably not common either, we'd use it as an insult to someone who's probably a bit full of themselves, right? Someone who's a little bit arrogant, a bit holier than thou. But I think self-righteousness is a lot more common than we realize. It's really the act of finding your worth, building your identity, finding your righteousness in some aspect of yourself, your character, your appearance, your achievements. It's just the, the act of trying to build your identity on something other than the grace of God. Which means we're all probably a lot more self-righteous than we realize, including me. Now you can see how this plays out in the lives of the two brothers and just how different they are in this respect. Okay, Quick question. When the party's going on and the older brother's outside throwing his tantrum, where's the younger brother? He's in the party, right? Okay, it's not a trick question. Now, I reckon he's in that, that party looking like a deer in the headlights going, I don't deserve any of this. After all I've done to my father, you know what I told him? I told him, I basically, basically, Dad, I wish you were dead. I don't love you. I want your stuff that's coming to me when you die. And then I took all the money he gave me and I wasted it on prostitutes and booze. What kind of a son does that? What kind of a son says those things? I've just brought nothing but shame on my family and I deserve nothing more than to be disowned and to be kicked out, never to be heard from again. And I thought I'd beg dad, please just, I'm, I'm desperate, I've got nowhere else. Please just take me back as a servant. I'd be lucky to have that. But you know what? Dad took me back as a son. Oh, a son, again, me? I can't believe it. 
You know, my dad has not given me what I deserve. Instead, my dad has shown me grace. Younger brother, he knows that his worth, his righteousness, his identity, it's received. It's something given to him. He hasn't earned that. He's got no legs of his own to stand on. He can't achieve that identity. He is completely dependent on the father for everything he has at that point in the party. And the older brother is the complete opposite. He wants a transactional relationship with his dad. He wants his worth and his righteousness to be achieved, not received. Because for him to have a received identity, to have some received righteousness, would mean all of that hard work he's done was for nothing. It basically puts him in the same boat as the younger brother. What an insult. No, I'm not like that guy. No way. And he's outside the party looking in saying, that should be my party. I should be the guest of honor. I should be the one being celebrated, not him. I'm the true son. I'm the good son. I'm the one worth celebrating. And that is what he's built his, his identity on. His entire life is built around the fact that he has worked hard and he has done good. And he has achieved a lot of things in life. But can you see what happens when you build your life on these things? Was the, uh, um, was the older brother a happy man? No. Was he full of joy and kindness, love, patience, peace, gentleness, self-control? Was he satisfied? Not one bit. He was a miserable, jealous, and bitter man. And at the first sign of not getting what he thought he was owed, he threw a tantrum. All of his hard work and slaving for dad have left him empty and devoid of joy and satisfaction in life. You know, I, I think the older brother in this situation had a version of the good life worked out in his head. And he simply wanted to use his dad to get that. So he's not that different from the younger brother. You know, his hard work, his good work, all his slaving away was just simply a way to manipulate and control the dad to getting what he wanted. He didn't really love his dad. And it's really ironic that the father says to him at the end of the passage, you always have me with you, and everything I have is yours. In other words, you lack nothing. What more could you want? It's strange, isn't it, that it's just having everything isn't enough for this guy. It's never enough. He's just never satisfied. And that will be true of every one of us who base our worth and our, our identity in anything other than the grace of God. Some of you will know a uh, particularly famous Welsh-born preacher by the name of David Martin Lloyd-Jones. I'm expecting a glory from my dad. It's a favorite of his. David Martin Lloyd-Jones, born of the turn of the century, 1899 uh, in Wales. By all accounts, a brilliant thinker, very smart guy. Uh, by the age of uh, 23, 1922, he had graduated from university with a medical doctorate. He didn't start off uh, wanting to go into ministry. He became a medical doctor, but uh, his abilities quickly led him to prominence. Uh, medical students were said to have skipped classes in order to learn from him because he was so good. At a young age, he was invited to become part of the royal a Royal College of Surgeons, which was a very prestigious society in England at the time. Um, and it was said that the research he was conducting during his time as a doctor likely would have earned him several more doctorates over the course of his life, furthering his already lofty reputation. Yeah. Now, you could just see for a guy like this who had such ability, such skill, such brains, that Ahead of him was this long and prosperous career. It was just a straight line to the top, a straight line to more and more wealth, greater and greater influence in the academy and in the medical world. And look, in terms of the position he now occupied in society, he rubbed shoulders with the elite. He was at the top. There really was nowhere higher for him to go. And he'd achieved the pinnacle of success at a really young age. So at the age of 27, he did what all of us would have done. He left the medical profession entirely to become a minister of the gospel. 
And he didn't just stick around in London where he did his training. He left London for a small backwater town in Wales. To this day, that town only has a population of five and a half thousand. That's roughly half the size of Glenfield or Albany by population size. He's listed as one of only two notable people to have ever come from that town, which is saying something. And he spent the next 10 years of his life there. The church had around 50 people in it, suffering from numerous financial problems, and also just had week minister after week minister before it, so they knew virtually nothing of the gospel. Why would a man with those kind of qualifications, that kind of training, and those kind of experiences, and those kinds of abilities, why would he leave London, which was the cultural center of the UK for a backwater town in Wales? Why would he trade the comfort and privileges of high society to rub shoulders with the poor working class steel workers of that town? Why would he trade all the wealth, fame, and influence for a job that could potentially leave him penniless with almost no guaranteed success by worldly standards. Now, please don't hear in this story an invitation for you to go and quit your job and join the ministry. Unless you feel compelled to, the wisdom of the story would say he took four years to make that decision and he felt strongly compelled to do it. Please talk to someone before doing that. I don't want you to hear that from the story. What I want you to hear is a story of a man whose worth and righteousness and identity was not wrapped up in what he could have achieved in life. It wasn't wrapped up in his qualifications. Not wrapped up in the wealth he could amass from a long career in medicine. This was a guy who would have had every opportunity in life and been encouraged by those around him to become self-absorbed, to build his worth and righteousness on everything he had achieved. But instead, he was a man gripped by the grace of God. It was said of him that he was a nominal Christian for the early part of his life, up until the age of about 20. He didn't really have a personal faith of his own. And there's no great road to Damascus experience for him. He just, you know, at some point in his early 20s, he came to understand he was a sinner who stood before God on God's grace alone, or he didn't stand at all. He came to understand that despite all he could achieve and all he, he could amass in life, he would always be a sinner in need of salvation, a sinner in need of God's grace. And that became the only thing that defined who he was. So what does Jesus want us to do with the story of the older brother? I think with this story, Jesus wants us to repent of our good works. Sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? Strange to hear that. Repent of your good works. What do you mean? Repentance is something you do if you're the younger brother, right? They're the guys that need to repent. They've done the obvious kind of sins. What does it mean to repent of your good works? Is Jesus calling us to become monks and nuns? Leave the world? Is Jesus saying all the bad or good things we've done are evil? No, not at all. Jesus isn't calling any of us to go and retreat from the world, and he's not saying the good things we've done are a waste of time or evil, but rather what he's calling us to do with this passage is examine ourselves and say, what is it that really drives us? Where do we find our worth? What are you basing your identity on? Is it the career? Is it the bank balance? Is it the grades? Is it your appearance? Is it whether you're married or not? The reputation you might have, how cool people think you are? If we build our lives on those things, it will never be enough. We will never be satisfied with the heights we can achieve in our career. Happiness is just always one more level away. And to achieve those loftier and loftier heights, it comes at an incredible cost. We would be a lot more willing to sacrifice our health, to sacrifice relationships and even character to achieve those heights if this is what we base our lives on. If it's money that drives us, we can never have enough to be satisfied, right? S safety and security with money is just 10% more away every time. I think my, uh, my favorite quote on that is uh, Monty Burns from The Simpsons, who's... Uh, the richest man in town, billionaire, and he says, uh, I would trade it all for just a little more. <laughs> you know, if it's your appearance that drives you, it's how you look, 
something's always quite wrong with you that you have to fix, right? You never quite look right. You never quite match up to the image we have in our head. There's always something that's off, something that's wrong. And I think the thing when it's your appearance that drives you is that you get really bitter and resentful towards people that are comfortable in their own skin. Always envious of those who could do it. If it's your grades that drive you, who are you when somebody gets a better grade than you in your paper? What does your life mean if somebody beats you? We're just never satisfied. None of the things we pursue like that are bad in and of themselves. God is not saying stop trying hard at school or stop taking care of yourself or working in your career. But really he's saying those things are terrible masters and they become our masters when they become absolutely necessary for us to be happy in life. Jesus is calling us not to trust in our own achievements, not in our own efforts, but to trust the righteousness he gives us, the identity we have as his children, as sons and daughters, the identity we receive from God, not the identity we achieve, because that is the only identity that truly satisfies and truly brings life. Lastly, I just want to leave you with some good news. I know it can sometimes be a bit challenging and confronting to think about what we've built our lives on and realize that sometimes those things are far from God. I remember the, um, listening to a Baptist preacher, the name of Robert Smith Jr. He would say when he prepared his messages, he realized how much that the word of God was like a sword because he said, every time I prepare my messages, I feel cut. The word of God is doing its job, cutting away the calluses on my heart and it's, it's breaking down the walls that I've built around my life. So when I get up to preach on Sundays, I've got the sword in my hand and I ain't going to spare nobody. That's what he's saying. I'm not going to spare you the good news this morning because uh, this is really where, where God has just been working on my heart, where I felt cut this time. Take a look at how the father reacts to both children. Not once does he scold them. Not once does he condemn them or withhold his love. Not once does he cast them aside or refuse to welcome them home. He doesn't take them in as second-class citizens, or he doesn't load them up with guilt either. And the Father is like that because Jesus has paid the price for every one of our sins. Jesus is our true older brother. He's the true son and older brother we've all failed to be. When his younger brothers left home and ran far from God, he left the comforts of heaven to go in search of the lost sons and daughters of God. Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He made himself nothing. He took on the very nature of a servant. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, Jesus was the only one who truly obeyed God and truly reflected his character and heart to the world. None of the brothers in that story could claim that. They reflected their own version of the good life to the world. Jesus gave his life as a ransom for all of God's children. He paid the price we were required to pay. He took the punishment that we should have experienced so that we could be brought back into the family. And by his sacrifice on the cross, we are healed and free from the power of sin and death. And as our older brother, you know, what's really cool about him being our older brother, he shares his inheritance with us. The Bible calls us co-heirs with Christ. And that's just a fancy way of saying that one day, Everything that belongs to Jesus will belong to us too. How different is that from the older brother in this story who's jealously guarding what he has from the younger brother? It is because of Jesus that the father holds out his hands in grace and says to the older and younger brothers and older and younger sisters alike, come join the party. Should we pray? Father God, we, um, we want to come today before you and, and repent of the times where we've tried to build our lives on anything other than your grace and your mercy, on anything other than you, who you say we are. And Lord, as strange as it sounds that you want us to repent of our good works, we come before you and we just say, we love you and you are the prize. You are the pearl of great prize, Lord. Lord, we give you our lives. We ask you to come in and to, to have your way with us, Lord. 
Fill us with your grace and your mercy. Remind us of how much you love us. And Lord, for those of us who have run far from you, draw us near. I pray you pull us back to you. Thank you for your grace, Lord, that there's nothing we can do to earn our standing with you, that you just love us no matter what. It is in your name we pray. Amen. 